Hi, everybody. My name is Evan Radisic. I'm the Executive Director of the Cloud Software Association. Thanks again for joining me for another masterclass. Uh, this week, we have Mark Soshin. Um, Mark has been in the strategic partnerships realm for, for quite a few years. He's worked uh, impressively enough with over 150 strategic partnerships with some of the biggest players uh, in the industry, including SAP, Salesforce, IBM, Microsoft, even Accenture. So um, he's, in fact, li uh, literally written a book on this stuff. It's on Amazon. It's a bestseller. Um, so he's got a lot of experience uh, in this realm of, you know, partnering with with giants, right? Uh, giants in your industry. And so it's a different approach than, than it is uh, partnering with uh, similar size companies. So he's going to take us through a few strategies, tactics, tips on how to approach these partnerships. Um, we'll try to keep this as interactive as possible, jump in there with questions. Uh, we've got an hour to spend together, um, so I will um, I will leave it at that and uh, pass it over to Mark. That sounds great. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Evan, and it's my um, um, pleasure to be here and talk about strategic partnering. It's a topic near and dear to my heart, a uh, topic that I'm so passionate about. In fact, I wrote the book on the topic uh, and published it a few years ago called The uh, Art of Strategic Partnering, uh, Dancing with Elephants. Uh, how to partner with industry titans without getting crushed, you know, and so I always thought of myself as the bird there and, you know, as partnering with these big guys like Microsoft and IBM and Salesforce and, you know, you feel like they're elephants and you worry about getting um, stepped on. Um, and I, I just kind of had to bumble my way through it. And the reason I wrote the book is because I wanted to share that information, kind of crystallize the content and, and share it with others so other companies could benefit um, from the strategic partner um, concepts to be able to grow their companies. And I've been part of three successful startups that have um, had very nice um, M&A exits um, with uh, strategic partnering as the core element and strategy around it. Um, before I get started, I'd love it if I could just hear, um, you know, go around Robin here. Uh, people can introduce their name, um, the company they're with, what they do, and maybe one thing that they're hoping to get from this session uh, really help me kind of tune and calibrate and make sure I'm hitting the topics you guys want to hear. Do you want to start? Oh yeah, so if I can go, I'll just call Okay, thanks, Evan. Uh, I'm Mark. Uh, so my name is Stefan Ryu. I'm a partner program manager at Zurek. We're a subscription commerce uh, platform. And uh, a part of my job working with, you know, smaller partner, obviously, but also the big one, Microsoft, AWS, the big SI. So, and been doing that for 10, 10 plus year now, but always good to get other tricks because these partnerships are always tricky. Absolutely. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for sharing that. Is okay. it Janos? Did I pronounce the name? Yep, that's, uh, that's correct. Hi, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Janos, uh, working at Bitrise, leading partnerships. Uh, it's uh, it's a scale up, um, and Bitrise is essentially a mobile CI/CD tool, a mobile developer tool. Um, one of uh, one of the like the most successful partnerships we've uh, we've done was with Huawei, uh, and the reason I'm here is that I'm, I'd like to replicate the success uh, of that, uh, and I'm I'm just you know trying to get some insights and best practices of how to do that. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Kevin? Yeah, great to meet you, Mark. Uh, Kevin McFarland. I lead partnerships here at a company called Utmost. It's a series B start focused on helping uh, Workday customers, so those that with Workday HCM manage a non-employee population. Uh, we call it an extended workforce system. Think what Workday is for employees, where and for the non-employees, all the consultants, freelancers, outsourcers. Um, that support a company um, and if you know the space think of us as also being a replacement and alternative for companies like SAP, SAP Field Glass or Beeline. Gotcha. Um, so that's what we do obviously work days that the, the, the um, big partner um, that we work with and probably what I'm looking to get out of it out of this discussion uh, you know similar to what everyone else says but I think most on my mind is how do you 
capture mind share and also work with a, uh, a company that vastly outnumbers you. <laughs> and so what are the, what are the key things to do and how to do that at scale um, when you have a small team? Gotcha, thank you. Uh, Craig? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Craig Gleason. I manage the partner business at Docebo, um, uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, we're, uh, we're a small team on the partner team, but as an organization, we just, uh, we just hit around 700 people, employees, I think. Um, we're a learning management system. So kind of your classic LMS, but um, certainly uh, we've, we have a, a modern take on that. So we've adopted some of the uh, new things that you see in, in learning. Today, today, we've had real success with OEM partnerships, a uh, little less, you know, with VARs. Um, to me, that's a bit of a volume game, a bit of finding the right, turning over the right rocks. Um, and, uh, you know, our next evolution will be to, to start to work with with the the larger you know kind of systems integrators and partners of that nature, uh, now that we've launched a suite of products, it's more interesting to them and and also how we've grown in the market, uh, as well. I mean, when you're the size we were two years ago, you can't get mindshare because you're a small implementation, uh, you know, small implementation from a dollar's perspective. And I'm just here to learn about various strategies and and approaches to, to cracking that, that, uh, that particular group of partners. Okay, great. Thanks, Craig. Well, let me share a few slides here just to make this a little bit uh, more visual. And um, can you guys uh, see my screen here? Maybe I'll just leave it like this if that works for you guys. I don't know how that looked when I put it on the big screen, but um, yeah, um, the, the title of this presentation is Strategic Partnering. It's not what you think it is. Uh, that was a title that was uh, uh, given to me uh, by Jeffrey Moore, who um, uh, I met years ago when I worked at uh, Crystal Services, and he used to come up to Vancouver and and um, you know guide us on, a, on our marketing strategy. And one of the things I realized is that um, um, for many companies, partnering is something that they know is important, but it kind of has different meanings for different people. And it's not always really clear how you do it, what the expectations should be, what kind of resources you need to put against it. So the first thing I want to do is just put out a definition there. Um, strategic partnering is about establishing high value partnerships that amplify your brand, improve market credibility, accelerate sales and create some M&A opportunities. Um, as I mentioned, I've been part of three startups. I'm going to share a, a, a couple case studies um, just to, to share more about the experience that I've had that you might find uh, helpful learning experiences. But, you know, a lot of times um, people know about partnering because we want to get more sales. And certainly that's that's the critical element to it. But I think they sometimes overlook the benefit that strategic partnerships can bring in terms of your brand and your market credibility. And ultimately, um, as I mentioned, I've been part of three successful startup exits where because of the strategic partnerships we had, it led to very nice exits that uh, were a great outcome for the company, the investors and the employees. Um, so um, most everyone knows that um, strategic partnering is really important, but sometimes, um, uh, especially with the big partners, um, People aren't sure when's the right time to do it, who to go reach out to. And one of the things I like to always call out is the right time to reach out to strategic partners is now. And the reason for that is because you always risk getting beat out to the punch by your competitors. Um, there's um, many times where um, uh, I call it the, the gut punch test. You know, If you were to open up your email tomorrow and read uh, that your competitor just got a major strategic partnership with company X, um, you know, which company would that be? If it was Salesforce or it was AWS, um, that's kind of a real wake up call and kind of a litmus test of, 
uh, companies you should be talking to that if your competitor announced a partnership and that would really have a negative impact on you, then that means that you got to be getting out there and getting to the table because often um, it's about these big companies. It's about who they're talking to. It's who came to the table first. So let me give you case study number one here. Um, uh, I started my career with a company in, in Vancouver called Crystal Reports. Um, and we were a small company, about 30 people when I joined on board. Um, and we, we had a great product. It was a Windows based report writer, but we had zero dollars for marketing. Nobody knew who we were. And even worse, um, I would say the market at that time uh, didn't even really have a category um, of report writing or business intelligence. And so we looked around and we thought, okay, well, one of the uh, ideas here is we could leverage an OEM strategy to go embed our uh, report writer uh, into other major products that have large distribution. And the two big players at the time were Borland DBase was, you know, the, the number one um, player out there. And then Microsoft had just launched a product called Visual Basic. Um, this this uh, comes down to tip number one don't the right number of strategic partnerships is any number except for one and the reason for that is um someone asked you know how do you manage the scale differences when you're small and the other guy's really big well one of the ways you do that is you um you partner with your partner's competitors and to level the playing field so we partnered with we got an oem deal with borland dbase uh shortly thereafter we got um, a partnership with microsoft visual basic um, and then Borland announces that they bought our number one competitor, a company called Reportsmith, and we couldn't believe it. I mean, uh, we invested all this time, all this effort, all this money, and now Borland's bought our competitor. So that kind of messed that deal up. But fortunately, because we had um, worked on another partnership with Microsoft, Visual Basic, Microsoft VB ended up taking off and being hugely successful for us that led to um, another total of over 150 OEM partnerships. So huge success um, in that OEM strategy there. So a lot of times I get asked, you know, what, what's the job of the strategic partnership manager? And uh, my answer to that is to understand what are the strategic objectives of your partner, what's their board directives, and be able to translate that for your company to find what's the right value exchange. So there's always a kind of a, a series of gives and gets. Um, everyone's usually clear on what they want to get from the other side, but you got to be really clear about not only what the gives are from your side, but what are the gives from your side that are of value uh, to the partner that you want to partner with. And that's creating that unique value exchange. Um, I like this cartoon here. It's uh, the little monkeys lifting the elephant says, all right, all right, you've won your bet. You can lift me with one hand. And I, I like this cartoon because it really illustrates that um, it's all about leverage, that that's what you want out of these strategic partnerships. When you partner with an elephant, you're a small uh, company, uh, you know, even if you're a big company, 700 people, um, you know, you're still smaller, relatively speaking, in the market. And so if you can attach yourself to a big brand of Microsoft or Salesforce or Amazon, that gives you a, a huge boost in the market, um, expands your credibility, uh, you can leverage your marketing dollars better, and the customers of your strategic partner then um, trust the fact that, uh, okay, uh, I'm a Microsoft customer, Microsoft has endorsed or certified this particular partner, um, so it creates a trusted um, buying environment for, the, uh, for an expanded customer base. And then finally, um, for most companies, the, the well, uh, well, for most companies, the, the, the two strategies are either to get acquired or to go IPO. And in either case, um, you know, having those large strategic partnerships is a huge endorsement. And for the companies that want to get bought, um, if there's already a technical integration has been completed, um, that removes a lot of the risk. And, and creates the relationship that you need that can lead to M&A opportunities. I wanted to talk a little bit about the different types of strategic partnerships. Um, you know, there's 
a lot of different kinds of partnerships, but at the end of the day, um, I think of the core types as being a marketing alliance at the bottom there, which has the lowest value. Uh, sometimes I call these Barney relationships. I love you, you love me, but you know, they're easy to set up and they generally don't have a lot of value, um, but they're a starting spot. Um, the next above that is lead sharing. So you can just come to some sort of lead referral program. Um, so you're actually agreeing and you come up with some unique value proposition of how together you're better. And um, you hopefully you, you have a strong lead sharing program. Um, above that is a reseller program uh, where you're actually on the price list. Uh, your partner is reselling you. And then the highest and usually most strategic is when you're actually OEM. Um, in the case of my case study with Microsoft Visual Basic, uh, Microsoft actually embedded our product into Visual Basic. So every customer who got Visual Basic got a light version of Crystal Reports. And by the way, there's white label OEM and there's branded uh, OEM. And I always push and encourage that you get a branded OEM because that's the only way that the customers can then discover uh, who you are and that can generate leads for um, opportunities. So, do you mind if I'm sorry, yes, Mark? Please. Do you mind if I ask a question? Yes, please. Sorry to interrupt. I, I'm just curious. You know, where do you see? And and this is great. I agree absolutely. I, I'm I have a maybe not as nice a name for the Barney partnerships, <laughs> as, uh, but uh, certainly at Docebo we're heavily focused on the OEM space <clears throat> as our kind of top top tier, and we've done that with a number of organizations. Where do you, and and I don't I apologize for getting ahead of this. What where does the where do you see kind of the 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 systems integrators kind of coming into play? Like, yeah, they could resell, but if you work with a CGI, are we getting to that? Is that coming coming up? Um, I'll just be yeah. quiet. If we if no, we that's are. it's a great question. So there, there's two things that I want to share with you guys. First is um, the partner ecosystem value map. I just wanted to kind of lay it out for you because there's different kinds of partnerships. And so I break it up into two dimensions with four quadrants. And so on the left side is what I call product relationships, you know, uh, relationships where you and the partner have a product. Uh, there's some integration and together you create more value uh, with that joint solution. And um, on the right hand side, you got channels. Um, and so if you look at the channel side, that's uh, companies who are somehow either influencing or reselling or, um, you know, those are typically the integration partnerships. I think of that top right quadrant is your global system integrators, your Accentures, PWCs and so forth. And then I think of the tactical guys could be your VARs and uh, um, your smaller channel players on the bottom right. And likewise, on the left hand side, um, largely when I talk about elephants and strategic partnerships, I'm talking about the big guys, Microsoft, Salesforce, that'd be in the top left. And then there's some, maybe some tactical product relationships, you know, uh, work better together, some integration points that have to happen. And so that might be more tactical product relationships. That's the ecosystem. That's kind of how the framework you should think about it. And then I have some, I'll just jump right into it, some partnering system integrators do's and don'ts. So um, the, the big Accenture system integrator guys, they are um, maddeningly, maddeningly slow to work with. So where I found success is if you can find a solution practice, you can find a leader or a champion who's willing to build your, your solution into their solution stack, um, that's the best way um, because they'll take you across the different geographies. Because I've seen a lot of startups where they get bogged down. It's like they got to work every single country in geography and it takes forever. So if you can work with a global practice leader, he recommends, builds you into his you know, best practices solution stack. That's going to get you the most leverage, but still be, be warned. It's going to take you a long time to get staff trained. A lot of times um, the GSIs, they don't want to take their guys off paid projects. So, you know, be warned. You got to kind of do it for them because um, they want to get their guys paid kind of as they do the work, as they do the training. Um, so a lot of handholding. And you gotta be ready to bail them out because at the end of the day, it's your product. And so, um, you know, 
you got to make sure that the customer uh, is happy in the day. And finally, just that the partner is just deal driven. So it's very reactive, which is frustrating because you see the opportunity, you want them to do stuff that proactively, but they're all about show me the deals today, you know, so if you can bring them some deals to help prime the pump, um, you know, that'll help a lot. Does that uh, answer your question? Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's pretty my experience it's, it's kind of been been my experience that it's mostly opportunistic yeah you know for the for the most part just their the way they need to interact with their customers and so on and so forth and those practices that they have you know um the you know the one thing i'll add is i'm finding that more of them are building managed services so if you got a technology that really fits into their managed service that they're developing yeah then you you tend to have a have a at least a a way to get in there now that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to navigate that you know that uh maze uh, of those those organizations but certainly um we're seeing more more of it so thanks for that yeah. appreciate it yeah and uh, just one other thought there i mean obviously it's about leverage so if you can look at your existing customer base and perhaps ask the customer and say hey do you guys work with uh, some uh who, who are your preferred partners and if you can stitch together you know two or three um say accenture uh customers that are using accenture maybe go back to accenture go to that practice leader and say hey i don't know if you're aware but you know we got these three customers it'd be great if we could um uh go leverage this to other customers we you know we think there's a pattern here of success yeah so cool. uh, let me go back to mark can i ask a question on this yes. one yes how have you dealt with identifying the services opportunity for these firms when it's probably um, when you're still a small company um, implementing the product yourself and trying to keep the implementa implementation cycle short? You know, I guess the situation we're in is I think there's a large service opportunity around us but our implementation team is trying to stand up customers pretty quickly. So just looking at what we charge for, for implementation isn't fully indicative of the opportunity for partners, but I haven't figured out a good way to, to crystallize it for them in the absence of them coming in and figuring it out themselves. Well, I think you have to be, um, you have to have a pretty good experience uh, doing it direct, doing yourself. And, you know, through that experience, that's where you can then articulate to the partner and say, look, for every, um, you know, installation, every, every, every sale of our product, here's the number of service days that that pulls along with it. Um, and so I think you can, if you can scope that to, them, to the degree that you can scope that out and present the value proposition pretty clearly to them. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you want to be leaving it to them to kind of figure out. I think you have to present something that's pretty concrete based on real world experience that you have. May I add something here? Uh, another trick, especially if your system is fast to install, is you have to present them to them as part of a bigger picture project because that's how they're going to approach it. So they're not going to do a two week mandate, right? It has to be part of a bigger. Yeah, Stefan, thanks for bringing that up. I mean, literally, at the end of the day, you look at all these guys like an Accenture, it's, it's a you know massive billion, two billion dollar uh, digital transformation project. And, you know, you're going to be a little piece of that. So, you know, I think Stefan brings up a good point in, in real, realistically, you're just trying to find that that part of the larger project um, that you impact. They're not going to focus just on you individually. So let me uh, dive back into this. Um, you know, how do you create balance in an unbalanced situation with the big guys, um, you know, Google, Amazon, Facebook, um, Microsoft? I mean, this is, I love this cartoon. It's like, you know, these people are doing the tandem skydive and the last guy in red there, you can see his concerned look as he got strapped to uh, uh, the hippopotamus. And uh, so my my point here is you don't need a balanced relationship to fly or to, you know, it, the key is you recognize it's an unbalanced situation. Usually the, the mistake that I see happens a lot is startups, um, assume, oh, I just got this deal with Salesforce, or I just got this deal with Microsoft. And 
they expect that somehow it's going to be like a marriage of, you know, two people like equal partnership. It's not. Uh, you're the small company. They're the big giant. They probably partnered with you because there's some innovation, some technology uh, innovation you've got that fills a gap that they need. And um, what you want from them is uh, to be able to get access to their customer base. And uh, you move fast, they move slow. Um, they kind of hold all the leverage in the negotiation. Um, so you have to get clear on what are the gives and gets. And I'll show you in a moment a spreadsheet that you can use to map that out. But getting really clear on um, what are the board directives? Like, for example, if you want to partner with SAP right now today, the board mandate is to help move SAP customers from on-premise to the cloud, the S4HANA pro uh, product. Um, that's that's what any that's all that they're thinking about. So, if you want a partnership with SAP, you got to be really clear about what are the gives that you can offer to SAP. They're going to help with that massive challenge they have of migrating their customer base to the cloud. Um, and then that's how you're going to get their attention. Um, so let me give you five quick tips on how to avoid getting crushed. So exclusivity, number one, never do it. Okay. Like I said, the right number of partnerships is any number other than one. Um, and if you do an exclusive, effectively, it's the same as buying the company. You, you, you constrain yourself from growing the business. Uh, second is your IP. I mean, this is your crown jewels at the end of the day. Uh, do your integration to the clearly defined APIs. What's yours is yours. What's theirs is theirs. Make sure there's a clear uh, dividing line. Um, when you partner with the big elephants, it always takes way longer than you think. Like, you know, a fast deal with one of these big guys would be nine or 12 months, and it's usually longer than that. So ask for money up front, ask for a half million bucks up front, ask for a quarter million dollars up front in non-recurring engineering fees, NRE, um, because that's gonna help your company get some money up front that um, helps you staff up the, the massive resources it's gonna take uh, to get these deals off the ground. And guaranteed, there's gonna be delays on the sales execution, there's gonna be delays on their product stuff, and that's just out of your control. So get the dollars up front so that you're uh, you can survive and, and step the deal appropriately. Um, kind of expanding on that, expect problems. There's the deal that you cut in the beginning is almost never how the deal evolves. So expect the problems and be ready to renegotiate. Um, you know, you're you may have made some tough deadline commitments on development uh, milestones. Um, they're going to ask for more stuff. So, you know, negotiate. It's an opportunity to kind of do some more gives and gets. And then finally, um, I always talk about the strategic partnership managers as being successful if they can avoid boiling the ocean and find the really specific tight area of value exchange and then expand from that, swing to the next partnership vine. But do one thing really pinpoint focus as much as you can get, uh, be successful with that and then swing to the next partnership vine. That next partnership vine can be either internal to other divisions and groups within that elephant or uh, swinging out to the next elephant because um, whenever one elephant likes something, uh, I guarantee the other elephant will be interested as well. Um, I'll also get a question about kind of how to manage a partnership portfolio. Um, it's, it's really important to set, um, I think, a fairly short term horizon in terms of expectations internally and externally with your partnership. So on a yearly basis, what's the goal? Reevaluate every year. Um, what's the priority? How do you uh, stack rank your partnerships in terms of value? The partnerships that were high value five years ago, I guarantee are not the same ones or at least very unlikely the same high value ones today. So always be real looking at that. The good news here, and I love this cartoon, it's a family that's been doing some RV camping together and they're sick of each other. Um, so there's an expression, you can't choose your family, but you can choose your partners. You can choose your business partners. 
Um, so being clear on the partnership priorities and objectives, as I mentioned, really getting uh, narrow on that uh, focus of the highest value of the partner, uh, monitoring that performance, and then reprioritizing annually. Uh, choosing which elephant to dance with, um, ask yourself the question, who are the leaders in the industry? Um, if you're trying to go into a new market, who are the leaders in that new market that you could partner with? Um, which large companies need your technology because they've got a gap? Um, maybe the analysts have beat them up for this particular area. And, um, and so now you have a product or service that can fill that gap. Um, which customer bases, you know, your uh, ideal customer profile, your ICP, which, which are synergistic. If you're doing small, mid-sized deals and they're doing enterprise deals, it's probably not going to be a fit. If it's the reverse, it's probably also not going to be a fit. So make sure you're looking at uh, the routes to market and the ideal customer profiles. And which have the best M&A potential. Like there's, there's nothing wrong with, um, looking and saying, okay, you know, uh, visioneering here, who are the companies we think might uh, be possible exit uh, candidates for us? Um, and then let's, uh, once you've identified that, go start building those strategic partnerships. And by the way, the people to talk to with the strategic partnerships, it's almost never the partnering group. You wanna be talking to the product managers. Those are the guys who got the juice. They're the ones who are making decisions on the product. And you also want to be talking to um, the business development or corporate development team or the investment team. Those are the guys who are also looking at uh, companies that are up and comers. So here's a spreadsheet that I'm happy to share with you guys. This is how I rank everything. There's, there's no partnership plan that I do that doesn't have a force ranking of uh, the top 10 or the top 20 strategic partners. And the way I do this is I fill out for each one, I do a brainstorming, who's the partner name, what's the category, you know, let me put it in the spreadsheet mode here. Um, here's the, uh, the partner, here's the category. What's their annual revenues? This is so important. I see a lot of companies, they partner with companies of the same small size and it, it takes almost as much time to do a deal with a small company, but it never has the return because they don't have the brand leverage that you're going to get. So generally speaking, if it's less than a billion dollars in annual sales, it's probably not a strategic partnership opportunity. Um, and then I evaluate it on three or four dimensions. What's the distribution potential on the scale of one to 10 as measured by the number of accounts they have or the size of revenue? What's the brand value within the, the ideal customer profile you're looking at? What's the value you bring to the partner? Um, and then finally, what's the difficulty of doing this deal? Um, and uh, as a formula, and it cranks out a number, and then you can just rank it. And then you can look at some of the detailed discussion. This is the most important thing about that whole creating leverage. Okay, so I'm partnering with Salesforce. Who is Salesforce's competitors? Okay, it's Oracle, it's SAP, great. So that means that's probably also gonna be other partnerships, uh, targets I'm gonna reach out to. Um, which product within, the Salesforce is huge, Microsoft's huge. So specifically, let's narrow down, which product group am I gonna have the best fit with? And what's that value prop I'm gonna offer to the partner? Um, and some comments and what are possibly some objections and, and challenges. This is an incredible exercise to go through and really get crystal clear on what the, the value is. So let me give you a second case study here. So I was with um, a startup called Top Tier Software. We did enterprise portals and we did that exercise of the top 10 and number one was SAP, number two was uh, PeopleSoft. Number three was a bond. And we couldn't get SAP or people's office attention, but we got a, an OEM deal, $10 million OEM deal with bond. And then as soon as we announced that deal, that got us meetings with SAP and PeopleSoft. And then uh, once um, we got a, a uh, we also got meetings with IBM and Microsoft, and we got a, a, an OEM deal with Microsoft. As soon as we got a deal with Microsoft, then SAP ended up buying the company. So it's funny how fast these leverage things. Sometimes it's hard to get the first elephant interested, uh, but once you got one, there's kind of this scarcity effect. They don't want to miss out 
And so if nothing else, they'll often do a deal with you just to neutralize any potential advantage that they perceive that their competitor might have gotten. So that was, that was a very uh, successful partnership strategy. So uh, finally, I'll kind of wrap it up here and then open it up for Q&A. But, you know, cheat, cheat, three things to remember here. Uh, partnering uh, can and should create massive leverage uh, if you focus on the big guys. Uh, partner with the big guys, the elephants of your industry. They're the ones you can create the real 10x value for you. And thirdly, don't get crushed. Remember it's an elephant. Remember it's an unbalanced uh, relationship and, and neutralize that imbalance by partnering with their competitors. So there you have it. Now I'll open up uh, to, uh, to questions here um, that you might have. Thanks, Mark. That was great. Um, I actually have a question um, that comes up a lot. And it's, um, you know, a lot of times your, your directive is to kind of pursue a written partnership. Let's say it's a, with a sales force. Uh, it's usually around the kind of, hey, we need this integration build. Our customers kind of want it. And you kind of start um, start kind of going up that road towards kind of kind of bridging that partnership. Um, and largely it's, you know, you're under-resourced to, to pursue a partnership of that size. What would be your, um, your advice when structuring, um, structuring this kind of, I guess these objectives for say the next six months or 12 months and, and bridging that partnership when talking to the CEO or a leadership team and how to kind of, how to, I guess, structure that conversation so that you're not um, you know, positioned to fail without, or at least positioned well to pursue it with the right resources. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, a lot of what we do, uh, you guys, I'm sure all know this, is that uh, it's internal expectation management. You know, if your CEO has unrealistic expectations about um, resources or about uh, the time frame, um, it's a problem. I mean, I'll share with you a very typical thing that happens is uh, the CEO of a startup is successful because he's a real product visionary guy. And um, and that's, you know, he built out the first few customers himself. Uh, and then you built out, um, you know, some nice base of customers. And then someone on the board, usually one of the venture capitalists will say, great, Mr. CEO, we want you to scale. Um, so now hire yourself, uh, you know, so the CEO doesn't know much about partnering, so he'll hire a, a partner exec, unrealistic expectations, and that poor partner exec usually fails after 12 or 18 months because um, it's just the expectations weren't aligned. So the way to avoid that is I think you engage your management team um, in a management offsite to, to go through this partnership worksheet exercise. It's part of what I do in my consulting practice, I, I help uh, facilitate this um, and get the management team on the same page about what's the partner strategy, who are the most important partners, and what's realistic in terms of uh, what we can achieve and the kind of resources and time frame required. This is what you need, because if you don't have the management team um, aligned in supporting this, uh, it's impossible to do this well. It's it's kind of alarming how accurate that description. I'm sure you're aware, but I mean, I talk to a lot of um, a lot of folks that are new to the role within a kind of a startup or a growing company as as a partnership leader. And um, what you describe there um, is is so bang on. Like it's just incredible how. Yeah, it's just like I was kind of giggling to myself. I had my mute, um, mic mute, but I was just like, this is scary how accurate that is. Um, and it keeps happening over and over again. It's like the definition of insanity. And it's like, how do you break that? Now, it's yeah. great to have this. I think having something that you can like, okay, if you can get the buy-in and say, listen, hey, Mr. CEO, I'm going to go through this exercise. I'm going to evaluate this and I'm going to show you why this is not realistic. Even with all that, I've seen instances where it's like, I don't care. Pursue it. We got to do this. Like it, there's no, there's no, you're, you're still kind of forced to go that route, even though you're completely under resourced. Yeah. So I think again, um, the education is, is something that has to happen. You're right. Hard charging CEO, you know, may choose to ignore the advice, but I think if you at least do, uh, the strategic top 10 exercise, at least, you know, where the priorities are. So, if you agree that SAP is the number one, then um, 
given the time and resources, you just got to make sure that that's what gets the attention. And maybe there's not a lot of time for anything, you know, below the fold, say below, below partner th three or four. And so that's where you're going to focus your time. And if the CEO is saying, well, why is there nothing happening on, you know, partners eight, nine and 10? It's well, it's because uh, with the resources we've got, we're, we're doubling down on the top three because we really want to 10 X this business. We really want to make something big happen. This is the one that uh, is critical to us. I think the other part to it is just laying out the, you know, the roadmap of what these things look like, um, you know, uh, and, and this just comes with experience, right? I've done so many deals, so many partnership deals. I can just lay it out. This is typically how it, it plays out. Um, this is how SAP moves. This is how their contracting process works. Here's the process it takes to get on their price list. Uh, they only go to price list review twice per year. Once the, one of them is in November. So if it's December, we got to wait another five months before it's going to happen. Yeah. Anybody uh, got any other questions? Thanks for that, Mark. Um, any other questions? Um, we got about 10 minutes here. So, I mean, if you've got a scenario that you're going through right now that you want um, a few years on it, um, go for it. Uh, yeah, I've got one. So as, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, one of our uh, most successful partnership uh, is with Huawei and the strategy I'm trying to like follow to replicate the success is um, reach out to other, you know, bigger players in the mobile developer space we're in, the Samsungs and, uh, you know, Apples and Googles of the world um, and kind of say, you know, see what we did with uh, Huawei, let's do that together as well. Uh, do you think that's a good approach or Absolutely. no go? That, that, that's exactly the right approach. So that, that would be the first thing I would say is, um, uh, okay, who's Huawei's competitors? I'd start right here and you nailed them. I mean, it's Apple, it's Samsung, uh, maybe there's a couple others um, and you list those guys out. And then I would do another row for each of those competitors and then really get into the details of um, there's there's another um, slide I have is the value proposition. We actually work out a, like a two or three slide exercise where you say, here's a strategic direction um, of um, Samsung. Here's uh, the major problems that they've got right now in the marketplace. Here is our value proposition to them that help them could help them solve that problem. Um, and here are the people who would um, own this. And then we begin a process of uh, reaching out to those people and uh, securing the meeting. And we've got the presentation. So it's not like we go in there empty handed. We know here's exactly what we're going to present. And we're asking for feedback. Do you agree with this? Maybe we got it wrong. Maybe this isn't your priority. Or, uh, but usually you get pretty close. And you can tell when you got kind of that uh, engagement. You have the advantage that you have the experience with Huawei and it's been successful. So you're likely going to come be able to come to the meeting with Samsung and Apple uh, pretty intelligent about what the market looks like, what the challenges are in the market and kind of the unique value proposition that you offer that's going to catch their attention. So I think you got the exact right approach. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions, guys? Mark, how would you think about balancing? So you just cut off. We're talking about the large established players with a customer base versus the up and coming ones that you know either might be might be trendy, might be getting traction, might enable you to develop a newer type of solution. Um, how would you think about prioritizing one against the other? Well, I would look at it if you can see here, uh, look at their annual revenues and, um, you know, if they're less than a billion dollars in revenue, I've almost never seen it work out successfully in terms of a successful strategic partnership. Um, even if they're say in the midsize range of three to 500 million, usually they're still too inwardly focused to really be able to work well with a, with a partner. Um, so uh, it, it's almost always the billion dollars plus. So I would just look at the annual revenues. And even if they're, you know, hot and sexy company that's, you know, taken off through the roof, uh, you might 
you might do some integration level stuff with them. Uh, so maybe you can say we work well with these guys, but I doubt they're going to have the sales force and really the leverage uh, that's going to help you. But you, you might put them, consider them in that uh, partnership ecosystem mix, uh, this one here. So uh, the you know high flyer, maybe they're in the bottom left. It's, it's uh, kind of a tactical product integration. Um, but I doubt very much that it's going to be um, in the top strategic category. Got it. Thank you. And maybe a, another question. So as you work with these big folks, and if you if you've partnered well, you've got a solution to find. Um, you know, I've done the legwork. Have a sales play. Do you have any tips or tricks for how to stay top of mind with the sellers? You know, best way to reach out um, to them again, thinking, you know, I'm thinking our, our big partner, they probably have a marketing team the size of our company, uh, just in, in one division. Like, <laughs> what, well, what's been the key practices you've seen and the best way to um, get mind share uh, as a smaller player? Yeah, so you know it's a great question. And at the end of the day, as you pointed out, the marketing team of you know one of the big elephants is as big as your whole company. So the first thing is you're you're not going to be um, changing the way that they do business. So you're going to listen to what marketing opportunities they offer, and your goal is to uh, be the best, easiest, most flexible partner to work with. So you get your kind of unfair share of um, opportunities, whether it's uh, placement of speakers at their conference, uh, you know, uh, positioning of um, um, references within some of the product management presentations, um, uh, booth, booth placement, um, case study stuff. So you're just looking for kind of those opportunities where you can plug yourself and insert yourself into whatever mark partner marketing opportunities that they're offering. Anybody got any other questions? We've got about five minutes left if anybody wants to uh, jump in there. Um, you know, the only thing I, I would ask is, um, I'm not sure if you're willing to share your slides, Mark, or not, but I certainly understand if you don't. Yeah, just shoot shoot me an email. Uh, it's uh, mark at sochin.com and happy to uh, share the slides with you one-on-one. Um, uh, -on -one. Mark is in the uh, in the CSA as well, so you can Slack message him as well if you have any questions. And, yeah. Um, yeah. This is this is excellent. I mean, it's um, yeah, be, being realistic, what we could achieve in an hour, but um, you know, there's a lot. A lot of us are kind of thinking about this stuff on a daily basis, and um, it is very much like you know, looking at Everest. Um, you know, it, it's it's really hard to kind of come up with a strategy in a single sitting on how to approach these. So if you can leverage people that know a little bit about the stuff like Mark to say, listen, hey, how, how's this being done? Um, do you have any contacts? Do you have any kind of resources I can use um, is gonna help out a great deal. So feel free to reach out. And uh, Mark, thanks a lot for, for doing this excellent presentation. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, uh, welcome. If anyone wants to um, you know, ask me some questions, just one-on-one -on -one offline, love to chat with you, understand kind of what you're doing and what the, um, some of the partnership challenges that you have. I'd love to brainstorm with you. Yeah, pick up a copy of the book too. It's on Amazon, right? It's bestseller, yeah. right? Bestseller there, yeah. That's uh, amazing. I always uh, talk about the, you know, there's not a lot of literature on this stuff, especially as it relates to, to SaaS. So it's um, it's always good to grab one that, when, when there is one available when people find it, so. Yeah, very true, very true. Yeah. Anyway, well, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining me. I'll let you get on with your day. Mark, thanks a lot for doing it. Yeah, and then thanks a lot. We'll chat soon. Okay. Bye now. Bye, right, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Goodbye.